Um, to keep the subject broad, um, I've invited Ranjit, who's a, a consultant a cardiac surgeon from uh, King's, good colleague. He's got a minimal access program uh, rapidly developing there, and he's come to talk about mitral endocarditis. So. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Atikon. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, SCTS. Sorry, I couldn't be here in the morning because I was in the training board meeting. But uh, so, um, Mike, when he sent me the topic, and uh, Ish, they said mitral valve endocarditis. Now it's, it's a huge topic. You can have a full day session on this. So I'm just going to cover some surgical uh, aspects of this and maybe share, uh, because all of you, there are some surgeons who are much more experienced than I am, share what, what can be the, what is their surgical options. So uh, I'm at King's College Hospital. Uh, I've been a consultant for eight years now. And the last four years, we've started developing the endoscopic program as well. Uh, but we get, um, if, if you have been to King's, uh, it's in a place called Camberwell. Camberwell Green was the gardens of the Queen before, but uh, there are a few gardens left now in Camberwell. Uh, and it's a very multi-ethnic uh, population. You get everybody from everywhere. It's the biggest drug capital of Europe. All the uh, marijuana and everything, all the drugs come to Peckham, and they get distributed. So uh, we get a lot of uh, IV drug my colleague Michael Myron calls them IV drug enjoyers, not IVDU, but IVDE. That's a new term we use at King's. So we do see a lot of mitral endocarditis. Uh, so these are the guidelines, uh, as Rachel covered, but these are guidelines for mitral endocarditis, and they're quite extensive. I'm very sorry for this busy slide. But uh, of course, if you have a diagnosis of endocarditis uh, with Duke's criteria, then all of them normally go on antibiotics. Uh, I'm talking only about mitral endocarditis. And uh, there are some classic uh, uh, class one indication for early surgery. For example, if you have uh, clear cut valvular dysfunction, destroyed leaflets, severe MR, or if you have uh, resist, uh, resistant organisms, for example, fungi or Staph aureus, heart block. Um, now, abscesses, I've seen very few mitral annular abscesses, really, unless you had a ring there before, uh, and persistent infection. If you have a prosthetic valve endocarditis, then you've got to go in there. And there are some class 2A and 2B indications as well. Uh, commonly, cardiologists push us for large vegetations. Now, my next slide will explain what size, but I think that's still a debate. And I, I think it's big, it, it depends on personal belief and also how the patient presented to you, whether you should go in immediately for a large, large vegetation or you can wait for a while. And the next uh, box shows that if you have recurrent embol embolism, then I think it's better to go in. But again, it depends where the embolus has gone. Uh, because as I'll go through my presentation, there are different series which shows how your timing of surgery can affect your outcome. Uh, so uh, basically for surgery, in my view, or con what I take home from the guidelines is somebody's in congestive cardiac failure, not responding to aggressive treatment. If there's any sort of uh, deep uh, abscesses or if there's a mitral ring previously done uh, and there's an infection there persistent, which will not go away with antibiotics, uh, unresponsive sepsis, uh, systemic embolization, not cerebral, systemic, and very large vegetations. And from the guidelines, if you have to derive, class one is again what I just said, especially fungal endocarditis, uh, I think we should not delay too much for surgery. And uh, if you have, uh, normally, if you can conserve the patient for a week or two, they get marinated in antibiotics, you might have a better uh, outcome of mitral surgery, whatever you do, repair or replacement. Uh, class two indication is recurrent embolism more than 24 hours of surgery, uh, antibiotic therapy, and if you have mobile vegetations more than one centimeter. Now, uh, whether to use a tissue valve or mechanical valve. Now this uh, is from the guidelines. If you have contraindication for warfarin, uh, young, uh, uh, women or if uh, childbearing age or if there's any other form of blood bleeding diastasis or anything which can cause problem with warfarin, then you can use a tissue valve or patients above 65 years. Now, uh, mechanical valve is, of course, we all know that it's called a long expected lifespan. Also in mitral position, the tissue valves may not do as bad as aortic. And if you have renal failure or require warfarin for the cause. Now, how true these things are in my practice, I'm going to come to it in a second. But there's a nice paper from uh, Inter International Journal of Cardiology by the uh, Infective Endocarditis Group. And what they say, I mean, this is a comparison to see whether 
And now this is, can you all see it at the back? Numbers. Uh, I'm sorry for this. Uh, this is a bit uh, small, but I'll just read it out to you. Uh, there were totally f in infective endocarditis patients there registered were 5,600. But they had to uh, take out a lot of patients, lots of follow-up, surgery was done for something else. There was no organism identified. So they left, they took out almost 4,000 patients and then they compared 1,500 patients out of which 900 received a, a, a mechanical valve and 37 received biological valve. The incidence, the mortality in hospital, 30-day mortality for patients who had a bioprosthetic valve replacement was 20% and mechanical was 15%. But, and one year again, the trend remained the same. Uh, if you see, if you see in this Kaplan Meyer analysis, the, the the variance remains the same. That the lines don't merge at all, and that's classical for bioprosthetic valve replacement. But I think the reason for this is also that the people who received bioprosthetic valve replacement in the mitral position must have been older patients, and they had different uh, characteristics which could have led to the mortality. Uh, there's another paper which is it's a very old paper actually from Ken Taylor from Hammersmith, and what this compared was different type of prosthesis removed, but this is for prosthetic valve endocarditis. So if you had a bioprosthetic valve, you took it out and you gave a bioprosthetic valve again, or if you had a bioprosthetic, you replaced with mechanical, and if you had a mechanical, you replaced with mechanical, and if you had a mechanical with bioprosthesis, there was no difference as such into, there was no significant difference of type of prosthesis for reoperation. So it's a little confusing whether should you do a bioprosthetic or a mechanical valve, but I think as we go towards the end of this presentation, maybe they might, we might all form some ideas in our mind. Now, whether to repair or replacement. I think, to be honest with you, when I was a registrar in 98, mitral endocarditis, uh, most of them were, at least in my center, landed with replacement. But now, at King's, we have achieved almost 40 to 50 percent of repair rate in mitral endocarditis. Although I've burned my fingers once, I repaired a fungal, my colleague repaired a fungal mitral valve and he came back again with massive infection. So I would, I would not personally repair a fungal endocarditis. But this paper, uh, it's a, it's a uh, very nice paper from uh, Bax and Dion. And this is a meta-analysis of 24 studies. And uh, they have shown that the repair favors replacement. So the survival, of mitral endocarditis, if you do a repair, is better, you know, at least the early outcomes, as compared to replacement. Um, as you can see here, uh, there are a lot of, lot of patients registered in this, in this uh, trial, and there were 24 studies, um, and 470 patients had repair and seven, 700 had uh, replacement. Uh, the late reoperation also was much low as compared to between repair and replacement. So. Uh, it is clear that if you can repair a mitral valve, and if you have the expertise for that, try and repair it uh, rather than replacing it. This is a small paper from Korea, which looked at 102 patients. But the interesting, uh, the reason I picked up this, this report is, for all the repaired fanatics, everything possible in repair has been done here, including a pericardial patch, ring annular plastic leaflet destruction, cord, new cords. Now, I'm not sure whether my cardiologist will agree. If you have a caudal rupture because of endocarditis, is it a point to go and put a cord in there and put some another tissue material? I don't know. I've done cords for uh, endocarditis, but I'm not sure this works. And they, they've done a lot of things. In fact, they have also done some endocarditis from to the right mini thoracotomy. And in this paper, they didn't show much of any difference at all. But the previous one was a meta-analysis. This is an actual trial of 102 patients. Uh, so they did not show any statistical significance. So again, we are caught to back to square one, whether shall we repair or replace the mitral valve. But I think that should be a personal practice and experience. Uh, so the repair rates vary between 15 to 40 percent. Now, we have covered about the mitral valve replacement rep repair, bioprosthetic mechanical, and whether to repair it or now, the biggest problem we have is when you get a patient referred with stroke. So if you have the new, it will be surprising, maybe we may, we may, may not get the referral, but I think off late nowadays we're getting people with some history of stroke or they presented with stroke and 
literature shows that there is almost 20 to 40 percent of patients can can present with stroke. Mainly it is staphyl aureus, and there could be a spectrum. You can have silent embolism, TIA, or it could be mycotic aneurysm, cerebral abscesses, hemorrhagic, or ischemic stroke. In fact, leading to in fact seizures or even encephalopathy. Now, all these manifestations and with stroke are related to high mortality. So, what is the timing of surgery? There is a very nice paper uh, which is a prospective multicenter study. Um, it's from France, and they have looked at, uh, and they, what they say is that if you have silent embolism or just a TIA with no evidence of any brain injury on CT scan, then early surgery could be beneficial. It has a 1.7-fold increase in, in mortality. Uh, and long term also, it's got a very good prognosis. However, if you have a complicated stroke where it shows meningitis or hemorrhage or brain abscess, then you have a very high perioperative mortality. I think this is very important. I've seen this in my own practice as well. So I think with ischemic embolic, emboli preoperatively, um, cardiac surgery can be pre performed in low risk. But if you have uh, hemorrhagic, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, then the prognosis is very, very poor. Uh, so I think uh, it should be prolonged for one month. Now, there are some recent papers coming up where if you do MRI and CT scan, you could subject somebody. And if you have good control over antibiotics and there's not a huge vegetation, then you could wait for three to four weeks and take them. But I think one month might be ideal. So just to uh, wrap up, what, is, what, is, what, what do we do or what, what we have done? So I couldn't go back too much, but I went back up to 2005. And out of 9,500 patients, we operated on uh, 1,200 isolated mitral valves. And out of that, 125 patients had mitral endocarditis. And we have a repair rate of 40% and a replacement rate of 60%. And in our practice, we put more bioprosthetic valves if we had to do a replacement than mechanical. Uh, and uh, we have a mortality. Uh, we also had a similar pattern as what, what's seen from literature is that the mortality in bioprosthetic valve, valve was higher than mechanical valve. Uh, we have had to do four redos. One of them was the, uh, the fungal endocarditis chap who came back. And the mortality, one other mortality was a patient who came in with, with a stroke, young man. I put a mechanical valve in him. And within two weeks, he blew a massive hemorrhagic stroke in the brain. But sometimes, you, a recent CT or images CT may not show you everything. But an MRI, I think, is much more diagnostic. And I'm not sure how much support you get from your neurologist. But uh, some of them, are, they come and tell you not, not to go in. But some people give you a very equivocal answer. But we have to tell them that we're going to use a huge amount of heparin on bypass. Because sometimes they have no clue as to how much of heparin we're really going to use. Um, now, what is the dilemma we, I have is what you do for patients who, who are intravenous drug abusers. And they keep coming back to you with hep C, HIV. You've done one surgery, they come back again. You, then they again, they keep coming back. What you do for stroke, which I already said what my problems were, if it's a young age patient, I know, but a young age with a stroke, you might say you should put a bioprosthetic valve, or you put, should put a mechanical valve, but when you put a mechanical valve, you put them warfarin, that stroke can bleed in the brain and you can have a mortality. So what do you do with young people? Um, then cachectic patient, I had a chap recently who was only 45, but he was so cachectic, he couldn't even get up from the bed, couldn't sign his consent form. But he wasn't intubated, he was passing urine, he was 42 kilograms. But uh, and severe mitral vegetations, and so my cardiologist said, either you take him or leave him to die. So I took informed consent, and I took him to surgery, and surprisingly, he did improve. So maybe is it age which goes into your favor? Or... Then there is prosthetic mitral valve endocarditis, which now, if you have a prosthetic mitral valve, which is infected, without much of structural damage, or even if there's structural damage, what do you do with this valve? And if you have an aortic valve in the same position, do you change both valves or just one valve? So this is open for questions. This is my last slide. Uh, Andrew? Stroke and young people, any ideas? Um, I mean, I would try and repair 
as many endocritics as possible, but that's easy to say in a lecture theatre, but very difficult to do in practice usually. Um, I'm usually reluctant to put tissue valves into a 40-year-old, even if they're a drug user. Or, although often if it gets them out of hospitals and people say they won't take the warfarin, you, you, you've got a light, there's a, there's, you've got a live problem to deal with in the, the future rather than the dead certain, certainty. So, um, so yes, I don't have the, the right answer. Right. I'm, I'm usually, usually reluctant to put tissue valves into 40-year-olds, but if they're really not going to comply with medication and that's the only way out, then why not? Anyone? Uh, Inda? Where is Inda going? I think I'm going to agree with what, uh, what's just been said. I, I would have a lot less concern about putting a tissue valve in a patient like this, to be honest with you. Uh, but repair is always the primary objective. The key, though, is to, as you've pointed out with the fungal case, to, is to resect all of the infection mm -hmm. and then start the repair from that point. And if you do that, I think that you'll get a good result. Uh, I, I just like ask a, a question to the floor. There's a lot of there's a lot of experience on the floor, so please feel free to uh, to um, offer your opinion. I just want to ask about timing of uh, surgery for endocarditics. I, I was recently in Brussels with El Khoury's group, and they take them on very very early. And he tells me he does that because it's very easy for him to see the margins of the inflamed tissue and the normal tissue. But and in my practice, influenced by senior colleagues in the UK, is to try and marinate them as long as possible in antibiotics and, and try to get them through that acute phase because I find that I'm more likely to be able to repair them later on. What, what, what do people think? David? <laughs> I think the, there's a small randomized trial, isn't there, from the last couple of years um, from Southeast Asia, from the Koreans, I think. And although the numbers are small, that lends support to earlier surgery rather than delaying. Um, I think... Staph, wasn't it? That yes. Um, but I think it is some randomized evidence that earlier is better than later. I think the case of... The strokes is difficult. I think certainly with hemorrhagic stroke, we're more conservative and, and worry about that. Um, with ischemic st stroke, it's less of an issue, I think. Um, we, we tend to follow those guidelines of, a, of at least a month with hemorrhagic stroke. But some of those patients w will die in the interim mm. actually and not come to surgery or be so disabled that surgery isn't appropriate. And we tend to try and wait two weeks if it's been an ischemic stroke, but that's just on sort of um, not not really on clear evidence, but sort of um, opinion. Um, and that's what we do. But I think probably in general, people should operate earlier rather than earlier. later. You would say we see so many endocarditis, we treat them, they get better. And they never come for surgery. Wouldn't you agree? So, what is the rest for surgery if they are well? Oh, and yeah, no, we're talking about when there's a clear indication, when there's a, a valve lesion. Not, not that you're right, a lot of people with endocarditis may not need surgery. No, but we're talking if there's an indication for surgery. Yeah. What I would like to ask you about repeated operations for drug addicts. Yeah. How many will you do like this? How many? How many times? We do at least five or six a year. No, 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 no. no. How Repeat. many times will you go back again and again? Yes. I've been three times so far. Why? <laughs> Why? Because I fear God. <laughs> Probably the, the... No, it's just that you can either leave them to die. But the other thing is, now actually, we have a psychiatric hospital next, opposite our thing. So we can call the psychiatrist, get the evaluation. Some of them have really given up drugs. Uh, and you know, so it all depends on that, isn't it? And then the ones that came back. Yes. I know. I know. No, the, the biggest problem, Michael, is that the, the zero conversion rate for Hep C is one in three thousand. So if you get pricked by mistake or something, you know, that means you are then you, if you happen to be one one in three thousand, you're finished. I think in my limited experience, 
and I have been uh, again in your situation when there is a lot of pressure. Somebody young, yeah. oh he has given up, oh he has given up, uh, uniformly failed. Now we don't have the psychiatric hospital near to our hospital, <laughs> so perhaps there is some influence of that. But really, I am beginning to get disillusioned. Mm. You're right, there, but uh, there, there used to be some senior surgeon at King's. Uh, which Mike and all know. He used to just take, if it was tricuspid valve endocarditis, he used to take the tricuspid valve out and leave it open. Okay. I've, I've, never, I've never done that, but you know. But the old dog. Sorry? The old dog. No. no. Okay. If, if they will correct their mechanism and they come with right ventricular dysfunction, and that has been successful at least in one patient. I know I've got small practice, but one patient that has been successful. Anybody got any other questions for uh, about any of the three topics? So I'll just kick off with one just for Rachel. Rachel, um, just of those objective parameters that uh, you talked about, is there any particular one with the least inter observer variability that I can? Uh, attach myself to more than the others if I'm struggling to work out if something is moderate or it's moderate to severe or I'm following a patient up. Do you mean on the um, grading? Yes. Of MR. Yes. So um, I think they're very much lab specifics. I mean, I prefer, um, as you know, because that's what you get on your ECHO report, regurgitant fraction and volume, yeah. because when you teach it, you can teach it uh, the concept uh, to someone who has a normal heart <coughs> because basically you're looking at the stroke volume. If, if you don't have any MR, what goes in through the mitral valve should be coming out through the aortic. So when you have trainees coming through, they can get good at the attack. It's just the continuity equation, really. Um, and then progress on with um, mitral regurgitation. I personally don't like the PISA. There are labs that will use PISA to do regurgitant orifice error because you assume, A, you've got to, you can only do it when you've got severe MR, and also you're assuming that the um, that flow recruitment is, is spherical. It's, you know, often um, you make all sorts of assumptions. So they all have prognostic significance. Um, if you don't, you know, they'll all come with a TOE, so you will get vena contracting, you'll get flow reversal in the veins. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it's particularly one that trumps, but I think usually a lab will go in one direction or the other, but I just, for yeah. me, prefer the regression fraction. Yeah. And, and uh, most of the MR that I see is uh, <coughs> eccentric. Can you apply a PISA at all in that circumstance? Is there any... Uh, we, adjustment we, of the equations that you can use. For no, well, that, that's part of the, the problem. So, so much of this, it's, it's primary MR, they've got prolapse. So, by def definition, unless you've got bilateral, you're going to have a very eccentric jet, and then you're assuming that sphericalness, but it, will be, it, it won't be entirely. And so, that's where, in a particular population, it slightly falls down. Okay. And the reason I have a bit of a bugbear, it's not that I'm particularly slacking off um, non uh, centres, but in my work outside, so I'm a, I'm a medical officer on the insurance company, so I get to see a lot of echoes from all around the world and sort of people having surgery and all sorts of things. And I'm simply amazed when there'll be a little sort of five-lined report that just says some severe MR, and that has been mm. the basis on which mm. that patient's ended up going yes. down. Yeah. So yeah. it is out there. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, anything else from the floor? To raise a, a comment on mitral valve repair versus replacement, I, I guess these days it's very difficult to speak against mitral valve repair, especially in degenerative disease. But this patient you described in the in the beginning of your presentation, so is a 77-year-old man. Yeah, a P2 prolapse will be really very uh, inappropriate to to replace this valve. But imagine this man has. Uh, a bar loss, myxomatous by leaflet, uh, rupture cordy, anterior and posterior, needing two, three grafts. What, what, what is the right thing for him? Repair or replacement? Yeah. Keep him on bypass for mm. four or five hours? Sh short cordy, long cordy, uh, ring too big? What, what, what is the right thing for him? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. And well, uh, I think uh, 
in my practice, what I would do, I would have a quick look at the valve. Uh, if it looks like a ballos with a lot of things rupturing, everything prolapsing out at 77, you're right. And if it, you said he needs three grafts also, you said yeah, well, yeah, whatever, you know, just if it's going to be that, that, yeah, then I would uh, I would just have a quick look and decide whether you know is it really worth repairing this or just give him a mitral replacement and come out. Yeah, I, but if I've I, I, I do a lot of mitral repair every year as well. If I feel confident that maybe one or two cords and a little bit of resection and a ring can sort him out, but I wouldn't be prejudiced that I have to repair this valve and spend two hours of cross time time and then at the end of it replace it. That might be worse for him. So you're right, it should be a quick decision, whatever you want to do, and then come out of there. What do you wish? Yeah, I find that you c I tend to put in my annular stitches first. Uh, Andy Goodwin taught me to do that. And uh, I find that once I put those in, there's some rapid assessment moves that you can make to try and work out how repairable or how confident you can be of, of that repair. And if those uh, initial assessments don't appear to be working, and I think you can make a, a reasonably yeah. early decision. I would be keen, even if it was Barlow's and somebody who's 76, to offer a repair, because I, I feel the data does support uh, uh, an advantage in terms of operative and long-term survival, but I agree it shouldn't. No, be that at, question. It shouldn't be at the expense of. Yeah, it depends of, on uh, the bypass time and the cross time, particularly if it's a concomitant procedure case. Mm -hmm. There are some series actually. And I think um, the guys here doing minimal access, uh, yourself and Inda and Andy, m might have seen them uh, from. Uh, Leipzig, they're starting to use the Alfieri stitch a lot more um, and it has been shown to have good longevity and an Alfieri stitch in a Barlow's valve can sometimes work very nicely. I don't know if that is something that you guys ha have incorporated in the minimal access work or if that's still very no. isolated in certain units. I mean, it would be perfectly reasonable uh, to replace the mitral valve and do three grafts in a very sick 77-year-old. It might be very easy to do a quick quadrangular resection and a couple of cords if the anterior leaflet is triangular in a Barlow's valve. Perfectly reasonable to do that. And I think the Alfieri stitch, I don't use it very often, to be honest with you, but when you've got a really sick patient who you want to do little to, doing the grafts and putting a quick stitch would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So I think there's a spectrum of treatment strategies. And I think it's really important that units have, uh, and, and I think they've recognised this, that mitral valve repair is actually a, a super specialist programme within each organisation. We certainly recognised that a long time ago. We only have two surgeons that do repair in our organisation. And as a result, you know, we're exposed to 150, 180 repairs each a year. And that's a huge amount of repair. And I think that later on, you know, perhaps my talk will be the most controversial of the day, but that's deliberately so, so that we can get thinking. But I think that that's, that, that's how I would answer that question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, may I ask, any of you had uh, a positive experience with the Alfieri stitch? How many of you have uh, put Alfieri stitch on a regular or semi-regular basis and got good results? And his patients did not come back. I haven't used an Alfieri in an elective situation like this, but I've got a colleague in the UK who regularly uses uh, an Alfieri in a Barlow's through his minimal access program, and that's based on work that uh, has come out of Leipzig. Michael Borger is the... Yeah. Is the is He's the in man. New York now. Say again? He's in New York now. Hmm. Michael Borger. Oh, Borger. He's Michael in Borger. New York. Yes, yeah. yeah. And he's so, the only one who... Who, who claims that it works yeah, in it came, it came up at the conclave uh, two years ago, and, and the whole audience ravaged him for even thinking about it. But people are doing it. I, I, I went to see a surgeon in Los Angeles, and he put in an Alfieri in every single patient. Um, but it, it has started to regain some popularity. If you actually look at the Alfieri data, there's 15-year very good results from the, the, the ones that he, he did himself. Yeah, but I am speaking about the real world. That's a patient in your hand, on the table, was the description I gave you, rupture anterior cordy, blah, 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 and you want a quick operation to get this man out. Our cardiology colleagues have this fixed idea that 
anything but repair is malpractice. Okay. And this surgeon is probably doing a grave uh, uh, mistake or should be sued. Or, you know, uh, I think uh, Steve Bolin in his last presentation was saying, you know, that my daughter is, is, is a lawyer and I'm going to sue some surgeons. So, so I, I think we, we have to, to send the message that yes. this type of patient it is legitimate to put yes. a tissue of valve for him and get him out of theater as soon as yeah. possible. I, I don't no. think anybody would disagree keep with you. No. Going on and off bypass, especially yeah. if you're doing minimally invasive. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree. Ranjit, have you got any comments? Yeah, I agree with you. Anything which takes more than two hours David? is not worth it. <laughs> The important thing which people haven't mentioned is to preserve the, as much of the subvalvular apparatus yeah, yeah. As, as possible. Yeah, of course, of course. I think that's very different from the old-fashioned replacement where you cut everything out yeah. and then sew a valve yeah. prosthesis in. Yeah. And there hasn't been a trial of some modern replacement with full preservation of subvalvular yeah. apparatus for severe MR versus repair. <coughs> um, and some of the data, even from big centers in the States, show Late on, you know, after two years, there is a recurrence rate with even good repairs by mm. good surgeons, and you don't get that with a replacement. Yeah. So, uh, I think there is a little bit of a swing back towards not thinking that repair is the only thing um, there. And there's a, a very senior mitral surgeon at my centre who, who's yes. the first to admit that replacement is sometimes well, in fact, when, the best option. When Francis I gave a lecture in BCS or BCIS and all the cardiologists, in fact, in London will love you because they don't want us to do repairs. They want to do replacements because they will soon get a tabby valve which they shove in the mitral position and then we all are selling big issue. <laughs> you know, thing is. So that's why we should try and do repairs if possible because you know, it's very easy to replace the valve. I mean, and they'll, they'll love it. They'll love you. you because they already have a scaffolding there. They will just go after seven years and keep putting valves inside valves inside valves, you know, tabbies. That's what is happening with. Well, I don't see anything wrong with that, do you? I mean, <laughs> no, no. I, <laughs> I still, I'm not that old to retire. I mean, At least they, they can, don't do it for ten years. I'm fine, you know. So. Yeah. I think also, Ranjit, we've all got patients in our clicks who've had repairs and now got severe MR. Yeah, so. but you've got a ring there to put a shove your valve in, you know. Okay, well, not you, need, you need scaffolding. Cardiologists are just waiting for a scaffolding. <laughs> they have a scaffolding. <laughs> And that's but, it, they'll start but Some but cardiologists, Ranjit. Right. Sorry, you agree also that yeah, the UK practice is a bit different from uh, European, for example, practice, yes. where, where you, in many instances, you don't see the patient again. Mm -hmm. And you don't know whether he had re recurrent regurgitation or had another operation elsewhere, or, or, or the patient comes back to you 15 and 20 years on. And I think the, the number of patients who come with recurrent MR is not small and it's not as the literature indicate. I think it's much higher, but people don't usually admit their failures. No, I completely agree with you, but it depends on what is the definition of failure, because if you look at the guidelines, if you review, what is mitral clip? Reoperation. Why does mitral clip work? Because it doesn't work at all. It doesn't. It leaves, it reduces the MR, the fraction of the MR, that's why it works. Whereas if you, if you have a severe MR, and you make it to at least mod, mild to moderate, I can say moderate plus is a complete failure. But the patient has no symptoms, the LV is not becoming big, and if you reduce the severity of MR, then, you know, and if it's an elderly patient, then you're still all right. If you go to any of the expert uh, meetings with people teaching you mitral repair, repair, they will tell you zero tolerance to yeah. even one plus, uh, and you shouldn't leave theater with one plus, because if you leave theater with one plus, it becomes two plus the following week, it becomes three plus the uh, uh, next month, and you shouldn't leave. So if you keep doing that and trying to repair valve all day and, you know, it doesn't make sense. And a functional ischemic, one in three have come back within a year for reoperation. So there are things against mitral valve repair. I know that nobody wants to, to talk about it, but it is, it is real. It is real life. I think you have to differentiate the ischemics from the detention. They're completely different. Uh, oh yes, I know. I, I, oh, I understand that. But even degenerative disease, you should also accept that mitral valve replacement has a, a place in a large number of patients. Of course it yes. does. I, I, I agree. And I think you, you're right. If you look at the European data, they do ha usually have a younger cohort. If you look at the series that they present, they, they, the expert centres in Europe 
seem to have a very early referral practice and that enables them to parade their repair rates which are a lot higher, probably because they have a, a much better material to operate on. I'm mindful of time. Yeah. Um, shall we take a coffee break okay. now and then we, yeah. we can come back? What kind of time, Sarah, shall we do that? Five, ten minutes. Okay, yep, then we can stick to time. Yeah, great, thanks.